So I think I think we'll get started as people continue to join us. Um, they don't need to hear what I have to say anyway. So <laughs> we're here for the panelists. Um, so welcome again. Um, thank you so much for being here for this fifth event on uh, synodality um, in the series Canadians for a Synodal Church. Um, so now that the Synod on Synodality is officially ended, um, it's really just the beginning. And so uh, the question here tonight broadly is uh, where to from here? Um, my name is Tara. I'm the new director of the Centre Obla, um, a voice for justice, um, taking over uh, for those of you just joining uh, from Joe Gunn, uh, who is the founding director. Um, the Centre Obla uh, was created by the Oblates about five years ago and um, really is to concentrate the efforts of the Oblates uh, for justice, peace, and integrity of creation. Uh, the efforts that they're doing all across the country, um, but to have an office, and it's here at St. Paul University in Ottawa. Um, yeah, so, um, and so just, I just wanna take uh, a moment to acknowledge all the geographical spaces that are represented here. Um, the geographical spaces that they are, are the ancestral lands of the many nations of Indigenous people of what is now called Canada, <clears throat> the original inhabitants and caretakers of this beautiful land, uh, this, these diverse pieces of, of Turtle Island. Um, I'm joining you from the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe, Agal Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, better known as Ottawa. Um, and I just invite you to take a few seconds just to quiet your minds and to breathe deeply um, and acknowledge and thank in your spirits, um, whatever way is best for you, the Indigenous peoples of your territory whose presence on these lands reaches back to time immemorial. So just thanking them and acknowledging them uh, in our continued efforts towards reconciliation. So if you want, you can put up your hand or an emoji. Who thinks we need a prophetic church right now uh, in this world today that we're living in? Um, and I, I truly believe that we can't be prophetic without being inclusive, which is is one of the many calls of the synod uh, of synodality. Um, without reaching to the margins and listening to those most hurting, um, not only members of our parishes but also our towns, our communities, and our our cities and our world, um, we're called to be a church also that goes out, uh, but also that reaches across the aisle to our sisters and brothers, our Catholic, uh, brothers Catholics. Um, who may hold different understandings of the teachings of our faith, who may have different political views uh, and learning to really listen and walk uh, together. Um, so the future of our church lies before us. Um, and we have a wonderful lineup of speakers here tonight to help us explore um, where we've been in the synodal process and um, uh, over the past couple of years and, and where we might go. Um, and so we have uh, with us uh, Sister Elizabeth Davis, um, Father Raymond Fontaine, and Bob Cherney with us tonight. Um, and I'll give their bios before they speak. Um, they're going to speak for about 15 minutes each. Um, and uh, and then we'll have a, a question period. And I'll take about three questions at a time and then uh, allow um, the speakers to address it. And we'll officially close, but then there's a sort of informal time to exchange and to and to speak afterwards as well, um, for those of you who would like to. Um, so I'd like to invite uh, Lucy to to share a prayer with us, just to start us off. It's very quick. Um, uh, so, Lucy, <laughs> thank you, thanks, Tara. And so we pray, Heavenly Father. We come to you today asking for your wisdom during this panel and discussion on creating a synodal church. Help us engage in engaged listening and meaningful discussion. 
allow us to nurture the bonds of authentic relationships, inclusive community, and harmony in diversity. Open our ears to your spirit so we might learn to better walk together co-responsibly for the future of our beloved church. And continue to remind us that all we do here today, all that we learn is in pursuit of truth for the greater glory of you and for the service of all humanity. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. So we're up to 138. That's wonderful. Um, so I want to give the floor to Sister Elizabeth Davis. Um, she is the former congregational leader and is still a member of the community of the Sisters of Mercy of Newfoundland. She is presently the chair of the board of the Gathering Place, a ministry for people who are homeless or precariously housed and professor of scripture at Queen's College in Memor at Memorial University in St. John's, Newfoundland. She was nominated by the Union of International Superiors General, uh, the Federation of Apostolic Religious Institutes of Women, um, to be one of the 54 women who were voting delegates at the first and second se sessions on the Synod and Synodality in October 2023 and, and, and 2024. I don't know if there's a mic on. Um, anyways, uh, Sister Elizabeth, I'll give it over to you. You want to uh, share your screen and. Uh... <clears throat> Good evening, everyone, and thank you to the Able Centers for in, in bringing us together for this evening. It's my responsibility tonight to give you an overview, really, of the um, the document, the final document that came from Rome came from the Synod uh, to set the groundwork for what Raymond and Bob will, will say later about implementation. As you see from my opening slide, the beautiful logo of the Synod, which carried us through the whole way, that very beautiful melding of our tradition, of all creation, of the diversity among us as peoples led by a little child, and the three themes that remain throughout, a communion that radiates, co-responsibility and mission, and participation. We were reminded from the very beginning, and some of you have been part of this process from the very beginning, that it did not end at the end of October of 2024, that it continues into an implementation stage and this stage is really critical in terms of making, the, re, reaping the fruits of what have ha, has happened up till that stage, but even more embedding synodality in every dimension of our church. So this phase is really the most important phase. The rest has been a catalyst, if you will, for this phase. Also embedded from the very beginning has been the way of communicating with each other that is named in this case, conversation in the spirit. And as you will note from my screen, there are three moments in that, uh, taking the word and listening, coming out of my own lived experience, making uh, my own experience as a person, my own experience on this earth, my own experience in my church, my own experience with my God. The second, making space for others and the other, and then building together. There are many ways of doing uh, discernment and ecclesial discernment is mentioned throughout the document. This is one that was used at the Synod and used quite richly and deeply, I would say. The first moment of the synodal implementation journey was made by Pope Francis himself. As soon as the document was completed, he said he would not write the apostolic exhortation, which is customary after a synod, 
but that the synod document would be our document. And he used that word. We are presenting this document to the whole church. He said, there are highly concrete indications in the document that can be a guide for the mission of the churches in their specific continents and contexts. So Pope Francis began this journey with us in a very synodal way. The name of the final document for a synodal church communion participation, mission, and it has three dimensions in some ways. The first is a reminder that we are all living an experience of church. And since October of 21, this experience of living as a synodal church has been intentionally highlighted. The second dimension then is creating, shaping a new vision that helps us be a church that deepens this synodality. And then the third is how do we become involved in this journey through consultation and discernment, through very clear formation pathways, all focused on conversion, synodal conversion, but always remembering that we come out of this in our very universal church, we come from various ecclesial contexts. The document itself is divided into five parts. One, it begins with an introduction, ends with a conclusion, but there are five main sections. There, beginning each section is a quote from one or, one or another of the accounts of the risen Jesus in the Gospel of John, John 20 and 21. The first section talks about the heart of synodality, helping us understand what we've been gradually moving to articulate since October of 21. Part two, On the Boat Together, talks about conversion of relationships. The word conversion is important. It's going to be picked up in the next two parts as well. But in this part, the fundamental part, the con conversion of relationships, that are about the building of the community and shaping of mission. And it uses the terms vocations, charisms, and ministries frequently in this document, more frequently than in the previous documents. Part three is entitled Cast the Net, and it talks about conversion of processes, relationships first, then processes. And the three key processes our ecclesial discernment, decision-making processes, and a culture of transparency, accountability, and evaluation. Part four is entitled An Abundant Catch. And of course, these phrases all come from the scriptures. It's conversion as well. Now we're talking about conversion of bonds. And it talks about the exchange of gifts across all our churches the bonds that unite us, even as we individually remain rooted in a place, but place is changing in our understanding. And then part five, so I send you a focus here on formation, formation of everyone. I want to pick up some key themes now that I believe are fundamental as we move forward. One, there are several definitions used for synodality, but I think the key one, synodality is a path of spiritual renewal and structural reform that enables the church to be more participatory and missionary so that it can walk with every man and woman radiating the light of Christ. This is the heart of what synodality is, and it therefore calls us to nurture, to have a greater capacity to nurture relationships with the Lord between men and women in the family, in the local community, among social groups and religions, and with earth itself. Now, this document, unlike the previous documents, is does much better in recognizing that earth is also in partnership with us, as we're understanding from integral ecology led by Pope Francis documents. It notes, though, very carefully that so many of us continue the experience of feeling excluded or judged, some because of our marital situation, some because of our identity, some because of our sexuality. 
that document had not been in the fine, those words had not been in the document that came from last time, the first session, but it was put back in this final document, very important. The fact of different contexts is mentioned over and over again, as we heard even in Pope Francis' own words. So the pace at which we would move in St. John's, Newfoundland, Labrador, is very different from the pace at which we would move in Santiago, Chile, or in Africa, or in France. A key uh, article, and the one actually that had the most num votes against it, was number 60, still passed with a good majority. It talks about the fact that women and men have equal dignity as members of the people of God by virtue of our baptism. That having been said, however, we still as women encounter obstacles in obtaining fuller recognition of our charisms, vocations and roles in all areas of the church's life. And this assembly, and it does it painstakingly many times, asks for full implementation of all the opportunities already provided that we're allowed to do. And the phrase I think is key, what comes from the Holy Spirit cannot be stopped. Uh, why did people vote against this? So there were some suggestions, some delegates felt it went too far. There was also some suggestion that some of the delegates did not think it went far enough. And it does, though, reopen what we feared had been closed, the question of women's access to di diaconal ministry. Now, remember, the Holy Father gave us this document as our final document. Ecclesial discernment. Uh, care for decision-making processes, accountability and evaluation are seen as ways we respond to the word, not how we're better organizations, but how we respond to the word on our paths of mission. And we need to deepen, be much more intentional about ecclesial discernment that requires a climate of trust that's supported by transparency and accountability, transparency and accountability in a trust that's mutual. And as we come near the end of the document, the, uh, the words of the document say, the spirit has placed a desire for authentic relationships and true bonds in the heart of every human being. And it goes on to say again, which it hadn't said in earlier documents, Creation itself speaks of unity and sharing, of diversity and variously interconnected forms of life. And then this text concludes when trusting the results to Mary, the mother of God, may she teach us to be a people of disciples and missionaries together to be a synodal church. Now, who is going to do all of this? Well, all the delegates of the assembly were asked to come back. Their work is finished as of the end of October, but they're invited to be synodal missionaries when we come back to our respective communities, wherever they are. We also have, and this is subtle, but I don't think we've noticed it well enough. Local churches are given a new identity in that they include parishes, which we would all assume, but also institutes of consecrated life and societies of apostolic life, movements of the faithful. And some of you on this call are very involved in movements of the faithful, dioceses, Episcopal conferences, groupings of churches. In other words, our understanding of what we mean by the local church is certainly broadened, canonically was probably always true, but broadened for us ordinary folk in this document. The document asks that ongoing evaluation be led by the Episcopal conferences and then local synods of churches, and that that not be just an idea or a notion, but that there would be people appointed to do that work, resources approved to do that work. And finally, the synod secretariat will stay in place with a major responsibility to ensure that the study groups that were set up would be, have the oversight to ensure they're faithful to the spirit of the synod. These study groups, there are 10, 
They look at the relationship between the Eastern Catholic churches and the Latin church. They, and second one, listening to the cry of the poor and the earth, the mission in the digital environment, the revision of uh, the Ratio Fundamentalis Institutione Sacerdotalis, which is the seminary in a missionary synodal perspective, canonical and theological matters regarding specific ministerial forms. This one is highly controversial. This is the one where the place of women in ordained ministry, it falls under uh, quite controversial during the synod itself and controversial going forward, I suspect. Uh, the relationship between bishops and consecrated life and ecclesial associations, ongoing touchy subject that has a doc, has a study group. Aspects of the person and ministry of the bishop, and this is interesting. He talks about criteria for selecting bishops, candidates for bishops, the judicial function, the nature of their visits to Rome, again, from a missionary synodal perspective, the role of pontifical representatives, the papal nuncios, as we used to call them, Number nine, another one controversial, theological criteria and synodal methodologies for controversial doctrinal, pastoral, and ethical issues. Under this one, for example, is the role of members of LGBTQ communities in the church. And number 10, the fruits of the ecumenical journey, a whole new way of looking again at the ecumenical uh, ecumenism. There are two additional groups, a commission to look at canon law and ensure it's consistent with the synodal approach, and then a very particular association around polygamous marriages in Africa and Madagascar. Formation is key, and the last section of the document speaks strongly to the profound vocation formation that's needed by all of us, bishops, cardinals, priests, lay people, members of religious institutes around living ecclesial relationships, around ecclesial discernment, about the discovery of the rediscovery of the Eucharist in the context of synodality, around form, a formation that's continuing and integral, common and shared, generative and transformative, intergenerational encounters, inclusion of popular piety, more emphasis on catechesis, not just for baptism and confirmation, but for all of us continuing to be drawn into mission. The impact of the digital environment, the culture of safeguarding. And where does this formation happen? It happens in all kinds of places, in families, small communities, parishes, ecclesial associations, seminaries, religious communities, academic institutions. It happens in places of ministry, wherever we serve and work with persons who are marginalized. And it happens in the world at large, in social and political environments, in sports and music and art. And always call to mission. And what does mission mean in our time? Commitment to peace and justice, care for our common home, intercultural, interreligious dialogue, commitment to defending life and human rights, proper ordering of society, the dignity of work, a fair and supportive economy, and integral ecology. All of that is the food of mission. And that's why the Synodal Church exists, to call us into mission. My greatest concerns at the, is that these themes will not resonate with ordinary everyday Catholics because the document language is still fairly theological. And therefore we may not see ourselves in that document. For others, we'll see, well, we did that, that's over with the synod, that's finished, now we move on, not realizing that the implementation of synodality is the heart of the matter. And my fear is that we won't give the time, wherever, whoever the we are, remember all the groups I mentioned, won't give the time, attention, and intention needed. My greatest hope is that our Canadian bishops, our individual bishops, bishops, will provide passionate leadership on this pathway, that every parish, and you're going to see examples of that in a few moments, every religious congregation, every lay movement, every place of ministry, 
ascribes to this synodal way and partners with one another to make our church truly a synodal church. And that we will also realize our own ways of already on a synodal path. And that will give us the courage to be more listening, more inclusive, and more welcoming. And I leave us with that final image again from John's gospel of Mary and Jesus in the garden. That intimate scene where Jesus says, Mary, she answers Rabuni. And what does she do? She goes out in mission. She went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Thank you so much, uh, Sister Elizabeth. That That's a great overview of, of the document and also, um, you know, picking the pieces out that um, to provide hope and, and um, but also the concerns um, that you have. So thanks so much. Um, I would like to invite uh, Father uh, Raymond Fontaine um, and I'll just uh, give a brief bio on him. Um, here we go. Um, so Father Raymond is a priest um, or has been a priest with the Archdiocese of Montreal since 1991. Um, since 2016, he's been the director of the Office of English Pastoral Services and um, uh, the Episcopal Vicar for the Archdiocese of Montreal as well. Um, Father Raymond has a veritable alphabet of letters behind his name, um, <laughs> and he holds a Bachelor of Science, um, a Bachelor of Theology, a Master's in Christian Ethics, and a Doctorate in Moral Theology. Um, so uh, he's lectured on, in areas of ecclesiology and spirituality, Christian ethics, bioethics, Catholic social thought, uh, and a pastoral ministry as well. Father Raymond is involved in um, various preaching endeavors and hosts Video Divina Evenings, um, which integrates his passion for the arts, spirituality, popular culture, and social analysis into his teaching um, on pastoral ministry. Uh, between uh, May and December 2024, Father Raymond was granted study leave to pursue research in synodality in Regina and acted as a facilitator for the Synod. Uh, his article, Hope Does Not Disappoint, a Jubilee Reflection on Synodality, will be published in the upcoming issue of the Journal of Critical Theology. So that's something to look forward to. Um, thank you and welcome, Father Raymond. Great. Thank you very much, Tara. And it's good to see so many familiar faces online. Sister Elizabeth is a tough act to follow, but I will do my best. <laughs> I will just share my screen now as well. Um, and share. Okay, and I'll go to from beginning. Great. Okay, so we are Canadians for a synodal church, and it's great that we're all together this evening. Um, uh, unlike Sister Elizabeth, who took more of an approach of um, really giving us a beautiful outline of the main recommendations that have come out of the Synod and the challenges, at least for us, I'm going to give a little bit of a backdrop on terms in terms of what actually happened at the Synod and the kinds of people that I met, the kinds of experiences that I had, not just because they were my experiences, but because I think they said something about the importance of what the uh, synod means for us as local churches and how we're going to begin to put this into practice now that, uh, as Sister Elizabeth rightly pointed out, this is now the phase of implementation. The synod is not over. The synod is only beginning, and we need to, we're being challenged to live it in our, in our lives. So let's move on. Okay, so we've already seen that logo. I think the logo captures a lot about the kind of church that we're being called to be all journeying together under the sun, under the under the invitation of Christ, moved by the Holy Spirit, people of different ages, different sizes, different colors, different abilities, but all journeying together in communion, full participation, and commitment to mission. This prayer for hope has been composed, I believe, by Pope Francis. I'm just going to say it at the beginning because I think it, it's, I like to look at synodality, not just in terms of its structures, but as a positive sign of hope for the church. Father in heaven, may the faith you have given us in your Son, Jesus Christ, our brother, and the flame of charity enkindled in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, reawaken in us the blessed hope for the coming of your kingdom. May your grace transform us into tireless cultivators of the seeds of the gospel. And may those seeds transform from within humanity and the cosmos 
the sure expectation of a new heaven and a new earth. May the grace of this coming jubilee reawaken in us pilgrims of hope, a yearning for the treasures of heaven. May that same grace spread the joy and peace of our Redeemer throughout the earth. To you, our God, eternally be blessed, be glory and praise forever. Amen. So, our call, and this was a call that was really pretty much ex pretty explicitly articulated by Pope Francis and by all those who participated in the Synod, that we are called to be a synodal church in mission. And early on in the process, the Pope added the adjective merciful, that we are to be a synodal, missionary, and merciful church. And, to, and each of those words could be broken down and can be filled in in so many different ways. But that is the call that the final document and the whole synodal process of the last three years is leading us towards. And, on the, and of course, the big question we were asking at the synod was not just what is it, but how are we going to do it? And that's going to be the, the focus. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background in terms of my participation in the Synod. As was mentioned before, I've been a priest for 33 years and uh, the last eight years as Episcopal Vicar in the Diocese of Montreal. So I've had an administrative position of oversight over parishes, recommendations around difficult questions around pastoral unification, uh, dealing with a lot of troubleshooting and uh, resolving crisis, uh, crisis intervention. And but when Pope Francis launched the synodal process three years ago, I really got on board. I was involved at our the diocesan level. One of the great things that we did here to get people involved is that because of my background animating these video Divina evenings for many years, we've been using the TV series The Chosen about the life of Jesus. And we've had three years, two, well, two years now over three, using the first three seasons of The Chosen, 24 synodal gatherings over the last two years using that series invitation to walk with Jesus as an invitation to us to walk together following the path of discipleship. And um, they've been very fruitful conversations. And as we've had them over the last couple of years, we sense deeper commitment. We sense a real desire to follow Christ more deeply uh, in a synodal way. So having done that, um, I was granted a six-month leave from my responsibilities as Episcopal Vicar to study synodality in a, in a concrete way. And sometimes you need to step outside of your local context to do that. Um, one of my best friends from seminary, and I'm glad to see people from St. Paul's University this evening because uh, I'm a graduate of St. Paul's. I, did, I went to seminary there, and I did my master's degree in, in ethics there. And um, at St. Paul's, I met uh, Don Bolin, who is now the Archbishop of Regina. We were classmates in the seminary, and when he heard about my prospect, about my interest, he invited me to come and spend part of my sabbatical time in, in their diocese. And what I appreciated from my past experiences of the church in Saskatchewan, both Regina and Saskatoon, is the way that they really seem to treat this idea of walking together as an important mode of pastoral ministry and accompaniment, and with a real openness to synodal forms of governance and pastoral decision making. I thought that was really important. And so over the, the, the months that I spent in Regina, I had the opportunity to work closely uh, with Bishop Don, with the diocesan staff, and with the uh, different pastors and the outreach ministries, as well as the leadership teams in the parishes. It was actually quite nice to see a real commitment to that as a way of life. So that was a, a real blessing. And um, I've learned a lot in that process. Sometimes it's good to step outside of one's own experience to see how other people do things. What was it about the church in Regina that I appreciated and from which I sought to learn more concretely how to be a synodal missionary and merciful church? I think what really moved me was the Again, in all these areas, they are, they are growing. They admit that they're not perfect, but they're making these priorities. And I thought that was important, that walking the journey of truth and reconciliation with our First Nations people. Um, creative ways of outreaching to victims, survivors of clergy sexual abuse and taking their, 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 their perspective and their voice seriously. Um, openness to different new forms of evangelization and revitalization of parishes. Uh, a strong commitment to ecumenical and interfaith initiatives. Any of you who know Bishop Don will know that he's got a deep past in the, a, a very deep commitment to the ecumenical movement. 
Um, I also learned a lot about the way they do the integrate the formation of the deacons and the lay ministry program and and attempts now in ongoing formation to connect that more with priestly formation. Again, we have a lot to uh, learn in those areas, but I think that those were areas where uh, I saw some real openness to what this, the vision that the synod was trying to promote. And um, and also the demand, the I was really attracted by the notion that they're one of the few provinces that still has a Catholic, you know, a, a funded Catholic school system. How does that work out in in, um, in, in practice and how can they um, live Catholic faith in a secular society and uh, and how they're opening conversations, sometimes difficult conversations, but important conversations, synodal conversations on the restructuring of, of parishes. So. All those things were areas that I went to learn in Regina, and I think that was a really beautiful thing. So that was my local church experience of synodality this summer. But then I also had the opportunity to participate in the global uh, conversation. Uh, although I'd been involved at the local level, um, an, an important opening happened uh, in the spring when I was invited by the Synod Secretariat to serve as a facilitator at a gathering called Parish Priests for the Synod. One of the things that they noted after the first assembly was that there were very few parish priests present in the first assembly of the Synod. And at the parish level, often things blocked that if the pastor didn't get behind it, I'm sure this is going to come up in Bob's presentation, um, if the pastor is not behind something, it's really hard for something to get going in the parish. So how do we bring priests on board? And I think that experience of bringing 250 priests from all over the world to have four days of synodal experience and then a meeting with the Holy Father, where he sent them home as missionaries of synodality to share the message with their parishes, to bring the message to their fellow priests and to their bishops, I thought that was a really great initiative. And it was through that that I eventually received an invitation to serve as a facilitator at the Second Synodal Assembly, which was a great uh, honor and privilege and uh, something from which I also learned very, very much. Uh, also, both in June and currently this week, I'm at the Villa Saint-Martin, the Jesuit retreat house in Montreal, where I'm following a fairly advanced formation in communal apostolic discernment. How do we use not only conversation in the spirit, but other modes of uh, discernment and uh, decision making in helping communities and congregations with important decisions about their future? So this, this is sort of what laid the groundwork for my foundation in the Synod. Uh, at this point, because you've heard a lot of words already, I'm going to show you some pictures, and the pictures tell a story also. Um, St. Peter's Basilica, we all know, that was the view from the place where we, the group of table facilitators for the Synod, received formation. This group of 36 people, we arrived three days before the Synod began and had three full days of formation in the processes of accompanying the tables uh, at, at, at the Synod. And it was a very, very beautiful experience. What I really appreciated about this group is that they were mostly lay people and mostly women. Um, and the beauty of that group, four of them are right there, is how we bonded. And I think everybody in that group was committed to a synodal vision of church. And uh, we fed off each other. We learned from each other in really powerful ways. That's another picture of the facilitators just before the closing mass. And you see the diversity of faces, the diversity of stories. Those people speak different languages, but they all came with a deep love for the church and with a desire to share the particular talents they've developed in facilitation. Many of them do this work professionally, and they made that work available to all of us. Um, Cardinal Grec, who was the sort of the capo, the chief of the of, of the synod, the head of the synod secretariat, with three brilliant facilitators, Christina from Singapore, Sandy from Australia, Avril from England, who's just founded something called the UK School for Synodality. I'll try to post the link later. They have wonderful resources on how pastoral councils and parishes can begin to put synodal reforms into practice. So good, really great people. Uh, Sister Natalie Becar, many of you have met Sister Natalie. Uh, she's been speaking in Canada the last week or two. Uh, wonderful, the undersecretary of the Synod and uh, the first woman who was officially granted voting rights. Now there's 54 others this time, but she was the first one to be officially granted a vote, but uh, beautiful leadership and uh, complimentary uh, mu mutual leadership in, in that Synod secretariat. Um, this is the Synod team gathered around Pope Francis. Um, again, very complimentary, very generous, not a big team, but my goodness, did they work hard. 
and they made they were their work behind the scenes made everything possible. I'm showing you a lot of the people who don't get seen usually, but I think are were a very important part of building a synodal church. Pope Francis arriving at the opening mass of the synod uh, on the opening Sunday. Uh, those of you who know Father Jim Martin, uh, I, I I happened to be standing next to him in the line waiting to go to Mass and uh, had a couple of really good conversations with Jim over the course of the time. Um, the Pope leaving the opening Mass. Um, this was a great visual, I found, because it reminded us that synodality is about walking together. And when we walk together, and so often you'd see people taking pictures in front of that. If someone was getting interviewed, that, that, that would often be seen. And a reminder that a synodal church is a listening church. And I love that image of Pope Francis, like, you know, like really focusing on listening, paying attention. We need to be a listening church. And I think that was well communicated. Um, you're familiar with the arrangement at the synod. The round tables tell a story. This is the first time we've had a synod at round tables with people, everybody having an equal voice, uh, as uh, was mentioned by Sister Elizabeth. The spiritual conversations were such an integral part of our synod experience and participation. Um, I was lucky at one of my, most tables only had one or two women. I had three women at the table that I was facilitating. Sister Samuela from Italy, Anna Miriam from Denmark, and uh, Helena, who was a laywoman from Switzerland, running the equivalent of Caritas in Switzerland. And uh, strong presence and the women's voices at the table were very much appreciated and valued. Very important. Um, Canadian participation in the synod. Linda Stout from Windsor, Ontario, and Sister Chantal from Joliet. Uh, Sister Chantal runs a parish and teaches karate. She's a black belt. And uh, the Pope was very much impressed by that. Some of our bishops were present as well. You'll recognize Alain Faubert, Cardinal Lacroix, Bishop Miller, and Bishop Pelcha. Um, Bob's brother, Michael, got a great picture with him. And the uh, he's also working very hard on that study group on the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. And uh, we can be proud. The Canadians uh, did well at the Synod. This is some of the Canadian delegation together, Kathy Clifford and Gilles Routier, two fantastic theologians who made a great contribution to, at the Theological Pastoral Forum. There were young people at the city. These are the two youngest delegates, Julia from Philadelphia, Wyatt from Wyoming. Um, great. They brought a great energy and really intelligent questions. We had events during on during the Synod that were not necessarily connected with the event, but with the um, this was a group of university students, 120 U.S. university students came to spend a week in Rome during the Synod, met with delegates, met with the Synod Secretariat, and we had a beautiful encounter with them. Um, another group that, that came to present uh, was, was the Catholic Institute for Nonviolence, Pax Christi. Um, these were events that would happen in between at lunchtime, so if you had free time at lunch, you could go and take part in things. Um, the outreach ministry spoke about the experience of LGBTQ Catholics, and uh, there too, some really important conversations were held, panel discussions, and uh, people really open to um, to hearing from that experience. Those of you who know Sister Janine Gramick from New Ways Ministry, the team from New Ways had a special audience with the Pope, and I got to meet with them the following evening. They met with a group of theologians to share their experience and their concerns about the church. So. During the Synod, there was a, a canonization that had a Canadian connection. Mother Marie-Léonie Paradzi was canonized, and there was a beautiful celebration of her life and a big delegation from Canada. There she is uh, being recognized at the, uh, at the, at, at the Synod. We, we moved on from there to the closing Mass, Pope Francis really being fully present and being very much part of the picture. We celebrated with the Canadian Embassy, the whole Canadian delegation. And as I mentioned, the Canadians were respected for their contribution. So I think we have a challenge to now bring the message home. Um, I had the opportunity to have an encounter, a conversation with Pope Francis. Those 45 second conversations are, are quite wonderful. And the Pope is, he's using a wheelchair, but he's fully there mentally and spiritually. His leadership is strong and was very much felt by everybody there. Timothy Radcliffe, who's really, whose spiritual, uh, uh, ret spiritual retreat really gave the shape to the final document and really shaped the whole direction of the Synod. It's a beautiful, beautiful presence. Um, one of my favorite pictures is 
me between Bishop Barron and Father James Martin. Someone said, okay, Bishop Barron a bit more to the right and Father Martin a bit more to the left. That's why we're sort of laughing in the picture. Austin Ivory, the papal biographer, really great people who made a contribution. He was there as an expert in the communications department. Uh, more Canadians, Kathy Clifford from Ottawa and Michael Higgins. Michael Higgins has written a biography of Pope Francis. Um, journalists from all over the world who came to cover the Synod and who really made a major contribution. We have people from National Catholic Reporter, The Tablet, Reuters, and CNN in that picture. Uh, the team from America Media, which is continuing to offer really good follow-up coverage on the Synod. So we were really blessed by the presence of people, a canonist, a spiritual leader, and a theologian, Anna Rollins, Miriam Wylands, uh, on other, either side of Timothy Radcliffe. We need the experts, as well as the facilitators at the tables, the experts and the theologians had a really important role in the Synod, more so, I would say, than in the First Assembly, and their contribution was very much appreciated. Now, I'm going to end with this picture, because this picture, I think, captures something about an image of church that I'd like to leave us with, and that's going to be a nice handover to Bob, is that traditionally in these kinds of pictures, the Pope would be at the very front, and then he'd be surrounded by cardinals and archbishops, and then the lay people, if there were any, would be at the back. This is the Pope is at the center, but he's not at the front. He's sort of in the center, and everybody is all around him, and people from all different perspectives, all mixed together, um, there are delegates there, there are facilitators, there are experts, there's translators, there's the support staff, everybody together forming one family. And I think if there's one thing that we take home from the Synod is that communion, mission, and participation are the business of everybody in the church, and that the church is incomplete unless everyone is present. There's a lot more I could share with you, but I think my time is up. So I'm going to stop it here. I'll stop my share. and. Um, Okay, did that work? I'll try that Almost. again. <laughs> okay. I'm looking... Thanks so much, Father okay. Raymond. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. And thank you for your patience. Um, and I will now pass it over to our next speaker, Bob Cherney. <laughs> thank you, Father Raymond. Yeah, there's beautiful photos and um, yeah, really representative of, of the participation in the community that we need. So I'm going to um, just introduce Bob Cherney. Um, so Bob was uh, raised Catholic um, in and around Montreal. Uh, he and his future wife met at Loyola College in the late 1960s, uh, a time of Adam uh, He was and he was taking uh, courses in contemporary theological uh, thinking at the time. Him and his wife came to Ottawa in, to work in 1973 and joined St. Basil's Parish in 1977, which he's still a member of. Um, and this parish has always valued vigorous and progressive lay involvement in, in the life of the church. And Bob, um, special contribution was leading uh, music at mass in the contemporary folk style. He and his wife were involved in the nine of, nine of the parish's 22 small di discussion circles prior to the synod and synodality. Uh, more recently, Bob took leadership um, on a leadership role of the parishes um, to further grow um, the movement of synodality within the parish. And so I will pass it to Bob. Thank you very much. And uh, if I can find, here we go. Here's my slideshow. Come on. So thank you. Um, how, how have we engaged with synodality? I'm going to talk about it in four phases before the whole thing started, because the kind of parish we are really contributed to this. Then the initial phases up till the the uh, uh, immediately before the first assembly, and then the period between that and the second assembly, and where we're at, we're at now. <clears throat> so, uh, before 2022. Uh, we were founded in 1960. It's always been an energetic and educated uh, sort of uh, parish. Uh, not everybody, of course, uh, is interested in the same things, but by and large, that was uh, uh, what we were like. And uh, uh, and we've we've had habits that were conducive to the sorts of trends during this period, like most of the time having a, a pastoral council. Uh, having women serving at the altar, other sorts of things. 
And then very specifically, we did a fairly elaborate exercise in 2015 to 17 of trying to reflect on the nature of our parish and what we were hoping for. Uh, it was almost like the word imagine uh, in that kind of exercise is the way the Pope uh, uses the, the word dream, dreaming uh, of, of what we wish to be. And that had some impact, but also prepared us for this period. Um, the more proximate helps were that the pastor uh, at the time that the uh, uh, Pope announced this in October 21 was very, very supportive, really believes in synodality. And he himself with a, a partly indigenous background, but with other things going on in our area as well, there were these um, resonances, these connections of, you know, uh, indigenous people who, who practice a, a form of listening and meeting in circles and that kind of stuff. Well, that seemed to help. And um, various individuals being participants and concerned like Catholics, future church, uh, discerning deacons, various kinds of activities. So there was uh, a fair bit of, uh, of, of interest going on. And uh, I'll, sh I'll show you this, uh, this uh, thing at the end again. Um, what I'm presenting here is captured in our submission <clears throat> to the second assembly. And so if you look that up, uh, you can find that on the internet, uh, you'll get the, the fuller version of what I'm talking about here. So then, uh, we prepared for a few months and then managed it sort of between March and May, I think it was, of 22, to have 22 listening and sharing circles. Most of them were in person. Um, 120 people participated, uh, 100 from our own parish. And then people would, uh, outside our parish would find out about it in various ways. For example, the network among Indigenous Catholics, uh, uh, but people letting their friends know and so forth. So we had an average, uh, th those groups are five to six participants, plus a note taker, plus a facilitator. And uh, the note takers you know, were responsible for getting in a, a, a good account of what had happened, anonymized, but still uh, all the material, which went to three report writers. And we, uh, we did a, a short report for the diocese as, as requested, but we have a longer version of that in our cell, in, for ourselves which included uh, very specific things that people were hoping for to improve or innovate uh, within the parish as soon as possible. And we were pleased afterwards to see that both the diocesan and the CCCB reports uh, were consistent with what we had sub submitted. So we were on the same wavelength as other people or they were with us, which, whichever way you want to see it. Uh, as I said, there were, there were requests for doing certain things uh, immediately, um, improving the way we exercise a, a, a sort of ministry of welcoming in our in our parish. We started looking for ways to provide uh, more concerted assistance on the youth leadership area. And one quite interesting thing was that there was so much talk within uh, all of these groups about the strong need to to have women participating in. Uh, uh, in an equal way, that the pastor uh, uh, told my wife uh, during the summer of 22 that really we ought to get going on women um, offering reflections during the mass. So not using the word homily for it, but reflections, but in any case, functioning somewhat in that manner. And uh, it was my wife because she had uh, instigated the women in the church ministry two years earlier. And she was aiming for that and other things too. Um, but uh, the experience with our, our uh, uh, sharing circles uh, inspired the, the, um, the pastor to say, look, let's, let's move faster on that thing. My own feeling about all of that was that we needed to pay attention to synodality, not just a bunch of things that we wanted to do, but a reflection on how we do things. So what happened afterwards was that during 2023, I joined pastoral council, uh, both interested in making sure that the women in the church ministry had a, had a, a friend <laughs> in my council and, um, and with an interest in helping out on synodality at St. Basil's. So the most concrete thing that I did at that point, and 
uh, I, I was, I was, you know, reaching out to individuals to help me to, you know, check my draft of this or that or debate ideas, but there wasn't any organization as such at that point. Uh, so I did weekly reports before, during, and after the first assembly. And then there was uh, uh, some presentations afterwards, both by uh, by uh, uh, Kathy Peed for the uh, Concerned Lay Catholics. Uh, she'd been uh, in Rome. And uh, uh, Dr. Catherine Clifford, two days later, uh, gave talks at St. Basil's to reflect on synodality there. And people from outside St. Basil's uh, were invited to come to those talks. And I ran around trying to recruit people from outside St. Basil's to, to continue on this journey with us. And what I came up with was a proposal. Uh, so this was like November, December of uh, uh, 22 still. Uh, now, yeah, it, it, that's when it was. And I said that during Lent of 23, what I ought to do, sorry, I got my, this, one, this was 23 and a proposal for 24, Lent of 24 was to test the appetite and methods for doing two different types of things. Should we have more of those small listening and sharing circles that had been so fruitful in early 22? And how would we apply synodality to all of our activities in the parish. So these would be the two areas that we ought to work on. And I should say, uh, parenthetically, that those sharing circles were an astonishing experience for many people who felt that they had never had a voice in the church and for whom there was never any likelihood of real understanding of the pain, the challenges, the, sin the, the, uh, the hurt that may have happened, the confusion. There were all sorts of things that people finally got to talk about whether they were in the, the, their 50s, 60s, 70s, or 80s, it was, it was a real relief to be able to talk about those things again. So then in uh, Lent, we managed to have four more of those sharing circles, and uh, uh, they went very nicely. Uh, and we also managed to <coughs> implement some of this syn the, the synodal principles in meetings of two different groups, the Mission and Social Justice Committee and the uh, Women in the Church Ministry, both had uh, like two hour meetings where they uh, utilized some version of the conversations in the spirit. And then uh, that was in Lent. And then uh, the next activity was to produce a parish report to Rome for the second uh, uh, instrument in Instrumentum Laboris, which we, we managed to submit on, <laughs> on the deadline day of May 15th. And that was uh, mostly myself doing, doing this work. So repeating the history that you just heard, um, the, the uh, perennial issues that, we had, uh, that had come up before, we just repeated the, again about women and indigenous and clerical abuse, et cetera, et cetera. And really posing the question, how do we listen to the Holy Spirit now and how do we incarnate Christ today? In Christ's time, he didn't think that doing his work then had to do with making sure that everybody paid attention to the previous 500 years or 1,000 years or whatever of Judaism. No, he was doing something that had to do with today and tomorrow. So how do we now do the same? Uh, we presented some of our uh, key learnings uh, from those Lenten, Lenten activities and uh, some of our worries about lethargy in the church. So with respect to the small circles, there continues to be an appetite for more of these, and it shouldn't be something that happens only once in somebody's life. Uh, so what should be the schedule? What should be the scope? How do we invite participants into participants, whether new or repeat ones? and whether they're just from within our parish or from outside our parish. And we have to figure out uh, communications and other, other sorts of logistics. This is all work that we're doing now. And secondly, about synodal culture, this is a matter of embracing synodality fully as how we do what we do by entrenching synodal principles, processes, and culture in all of our ministries and committees. So, this means uh, sort of a suite of concerns. Inclusion, both in, in two different senses of inclusion. First of all, the, the uh, ministry or group in, or activity in question 
who's who's there you know inside the tent while this is being planned and carried out and inclusion beyond the uh, organizing group uh is everybody who who could have an interest or a stake in this matter being included after all we are trying to follow the principle of nothing about us without us a second main thing is to examine co-responsibility the balance of lay responsibility and clerical responsibility and parenthetically um i'm not surprised about uh puzzlement or lethargy or um or or doubts on the part of today's uh, uh pastors and priests because they were they were recruited and trained in a different mode and you uh and they, they felt that you know uh they're taking responsibility they were told all, over and over again that they are their shepherds and the sheep are not all that bright so it's a real revolution to to be told no no now we're we're having to uh work together and third main thing is using the conversations in the spirit methodology and what that means is that you're valuing all members fully rather than having one person or a few people dominate this encourages each member to make a genuine contribution and commits all members to listen and respond deeply rather than holding on to their preconceived ideas and agendas and it devalues prayer and prayerful reflection in order to hear the urgings of the holy spirit this is not easy. And in the two experiences that we had uh, in, uh, in Lent, I mentioned uh, uh, two groups uh, put this on. Clearly, there was a strong intention to, to act in this manner. And clearly, people who haven't been really uh, well trained to do that, and uh, you know, just get enthusiastic and say, well, wait a second, wait a second, you know, they have to jump in, they have to interrupt, they have to continue on and on. So you know <laughs> this this is not easy stuff to do um and uh it really needs careful planning and competent facilitators so this is another thing on the agenda of the we <laughs> that's now involved uh, the we is myself as part of a six member synodality team um where we want to plan and promote how we continue this journey together uh we report to pastoral council uh in the fall now there were two more uses of the conversations in the spirit um i don't have anything in particular to tell you about that though uh, we again did uh, messages before and during uh the second assembly and we'll be doing some more communicating very soon and uh very soon as well I, actually this sunday uh catherine clever will will be addressing us uh, coming to a, a lunch after mass and uh uh, talking to us about what happened so for me uh this is a this is a rough template of something that that worked in our parish and we had the advantage that um we we started a long time ago being the sort of place that would welcome this sort of thing a parish where lay people have always been uh very active in in various ways uh and very specific things about uh about welcoming refugees we've had a lot of uh, those experiences and uh, food security and and um, other other ways of paying attention to to people who are not well off in our area or otherwise uh, peripheral and so on and i apologize to to my uh, fellow parishioners for rushing along and, and forgetting to mention some of these things but that's not the important thing the important thing is we were lucky enough to be the sort of parish that could understand what the Pope was getting at and embrace it and just have the opportunity to uh, really uh, to, to have the support of, of, uh, of the Pope in, in wanting to, to contribute in this manner. So my main takeaway is as the, uh, that very important piece of literature, green eggs and ham, try it, try it and you'll see, all right? The, uh, the uh, irritating young fellow is is telling the older person would you like green eggs and ham and of course the older person says no and finally he persists so long he does try it and lo and behold yeah it's not so bad so uh please use the the report if you wish and find it uh on the internet or call me if you like or send me an email 
and I'd be glad to chat with you about uh, the possibilities of uh, what you'd like to do. And I've got all sorts of notes here that I forgot to do, cover, but whatever. Oh yeah, about the the conversations in the sphere. One of the th one of the takeaways from that is that if you do that, then the quieter people do get a chance to speak. And guess what? That's not just good for them. It's good for the whole group because now the whole group knows what the quieter people were thinking. For goodness gracious, do it. All right, that's it. Thank you so much, Bob, um, for that really concrete example and, and uh, detailed example about how it might come out, how it might, how it might be carried out in, in a parish. Uh, and it's not too late to start that process. And thank you so much for your generosity in uh, posting <laughs> your contact information. You might have to get a secretary to schedule <laughs> for all the people on this call. Um, Yes, yeah, so we'll move to a question period now. Uh, I have one question already that, that came through in the, the chat, and uh, it's open to any of the three panelists, um, or more than one as well. Um, so the first, um, and I'll, actually I'll take two more questions, and then I'll, I'll repeat the, the, the first one. Um, so uh, if people can raise their hands if they have a question or, or a comment that they would like. We'll go. I'll, I'll I'll mention the first is um, just if someone could unpack the phrase ecclesial discernment. What does that mean? What did it mean for the synod? Um, oh, and I see Pamela. Um, so Pamela, if you want to ask your question, you can did just. You, yeah. Did you want the panelists to respond to your first question before I ask my question, or I'm going to take uh, questions in groups of three, just so that we we have a representative, and then the the um, the speakers can respond to those three. So you can go ahead if you would like. All right. My question is in in looking to begin a synodal process and getting the feel from your local parish. What could you suggest as ways to engage? parishioners effectively when they may believe a there is already enough engagement they're too busy because they're doing all these other things or they don't they're not really seeing the benefit of synodality thank you i'll take one more question for now and then we can come back after the uh the answer Uh, go ahead, uh, Francis. My question is uh, to any of the panelists, are they familiar with Christian Life Communities, which is a, a Jesuit um, formation program, which has been in operation in Canada for a long time, and it seems like a great resource to be used at the parish level. So just a question as to any of you familiar with that. Thank you. Thank you for your presentations. Thank you. Uh, so just uh, quickly uh, recap. Um, so ecclesial discernment, um, ways to engage parishioners when there, there might be some blockages to that, and Christian life communities as a resource from the Jesuits. Um, go ahead, Father Raymond. I think, uh, let me tackle the discernment question, because I thought that was one of the most important things that we talked about at the Synod. That chapter on ecclesial discernment, decision-making processes, and then the trio of transparency, accountability, and evaluation were really seen as like three aspects of a common reality of how do we prayerfully make important decisions about the future, and how do we do it in a way that really um, takes the input of the community seriously. Um, number 84 in the document, I'm going to quote it because I think it's really interesting. That someone said, I was at a webinar recently, and said, whenever you've got bullet points in a paragraph, often it's a very specific thing that they're looking for. So the steps of ecclesial discernment will differ according to various places, but these elements should be included. And this is really, I think, maybe helpful for understanding what we mean by ecclesial discernment. Clearly setting out the object and giving people the means for adequately understanding the question that's being discerned. Giving sufficient time for prayerful preparation 
listening to the word of God in reflection. An inner disposition of freedom regarding our interests and a commitment to the common good of the group. Allowing time to listen respectfully and deeply to each person's voice. Searching for the widest possible consensus without hiding conflicts or searching for the lowest common denominator. And arriving at a consensus in such a way that participants have the right to say whether they recognize themselves in it or not. And what they observe at the end of that paragraph is that if you take the time and the energy to really do that kind of a discernment on an important question facing a community, what you're going to find is that even if a person's individual preference or choice is not accepted by the group, th this discernment process should, in principle, lead to a mature acceptance by all of the decision. And it also, it also it's a recognition that in discernment, we discern with the information that we have, and then other things can happen. And it might be that a year later, in light of the consequences of the decision, um, we might want to revisit it. So that, that that I think that's also very important that we discern with the information that we have at a given time, but it's an ongoing process. It doesn't necessarily uh, so a, a year later we might need to review the decision in the light of how it's actually affecting real people. So uh, and you can see how conversations in the spirit easily fit into part of that process, but they're not the whole thing. I think another important element and. <clears throat> It's the ecclesial side of ecclesial discernment, if you will. <clears throat> it comes back to that uh, the trust between the lay people and the priests and the bishops and that element of trust and openness and willingness to listen to each other is something that's not always present in our parishes and dioceses, I'm afraid. But and it's, and it takes a, a long time to build trust. Mm -hmm. The other element which Barbara referenced is when we're discerning about something, it is really important the people th who are most directly affected are part of the discernment. One of my very grave concerns about the 10 study groups that have been set up <clears throat> is they're not very reflective of the people they're talking about. So for example, the first one, which is about the Eastern Catholic Church and the Latin Church, are all men. Now, they're all clerics from both churches, equally divided, but I'm sure half, more than half, the Latin Church is women. I'm assuming probably half or more of the Eastern Churches are women, and yet they, they're not on that study group. The study, the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith is doing the one on women, very few women in the dicastery, and very few, the women who are there are mostly all from Italy. Very convenient because it's easy to bring them together, but Italy is hardly a representative country in our earth. It's one of the smallest language groups on earth. So it's it's really difficult to talk that, about that being representative. The uh, working group on the poor, and I asked the question, how many poor people are on that working group, study group? Uh, based on the names I saw, very few, probably zero, are actually poor people. So, you know, it's easier to talk about ecclesial discernment objective uh, in, a, in a, a theoretical way, but the basis of this is inclusion. How we go about it is, is very important in terms of process, making sure everybody has their voice, but that assumes you have the right people at the table in the first place. So I think that's an issue that we have to keep reminding ourselves of, which is why I like the expanded version of local churches, for example, understanding. But in the conversation about women in the diaconate, how many women who are very interested in a vocation to the diaconate are part of those conversations? They tend to be excluded. How many women who are interested in ordination for women and men let the spirit have her voice, as the document says, um, not included? So where some groups came into the Senate Hall and were very graciously met, many of the groups that see themselves as reform groups were not so well equally met. So we have to be very careful to, to, to treat this discernment 
ecclesial discernment with a very high, high, high degree of humility because we're very poor at it, very poor, poorer than many, many other parts of this earth, actually. Um, I'd like to just make a very short comment uh, because uh, Sister Elizabeth mentioned about the uh, the worries that she has about, uh, about uh, some of the, the uh, study groups. And I would simply say that those study groups, uh, I, I don't think, this is just me saying it, I don't think they ought to be seen as a subset or as a, an, an emanation or a, part, a portion of synodality. They have all the characteristics of something thrown together hurriedly uh, in order to be able to say we're not ignoring this or that and you know when they report in uh, next June hopefully they'll say some useful things that'll add you know a little a little uh, break or two to the edifice but that but anybody who really embraced this very thorough very complex process of synodality and then has to read a report from you know 11 people or 17 people kind of tossed together with a very short time frame and say, well, that's just as good as, as, as the other stuff. No, it's not. Uh, and, and we'll have to be vigilant and make sure that it's not given more, uh, more credence than it deserves. Thank you. I don't well, know. I'm going to echo one thing and I'll also try to answer sister Francis's question. Uh, in terms of what uh, Sister Elizabeth so beautifully brought out, uh, there was a, one intervention from the floor that really stopped a lot of people in their tracks. Uh, I think it might have happened after you were, were no longer there, Elizabeth, but uh, uh, a woman who basically said, in, in just in a very simple way, why is it that when a man feels a call to serve, it's called a vocation, but if a woman feels a call to serve, it's an ideology? It was just such a powerful statement and um she said it right pope was in the room every a lot of people heard that statement and people came up to her and really spoke to her afterwards and and and, and commended her courage for, for 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 saying that um in just in response to what sister francis asked before uh i'm here at villa saint martin in montreal right now and three of the 12 people who are doing this formation and communal apostolic discernment are people with a strong background in the what they call the cvx in french uh, community, community de vie chrétienne, so the Christian life communities. And I um, I wonder sometimes whether they're st equally strong across the country or are they more concentrated in certain areas. But certainly, one of the things that I thought was really important at the Synod is that there was a recognition that people in consecrated, that, that, that the experience of consecrated life, both women's and men's religious communities, you know, they have a lot to teach the global church about synodal structures and about different forms of governance. It doesn't mean that they do it perfectly, but I think there's a greater openness and longer history in consecrated life of synodal and communal discernment. So something that we can continue to learn from. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I'm just keeping in mind uh, also the question about uh, ways of engaging parishioners that where there might be uh, blockages. So we'll we'll keep that question, um, and I'll take uh, Kathy Pete's question as well. My question is about uh, developing a theology of the laity. So my sense as a lay person, uh, working, studying, uh, ministering in this church for most of my life, uh, is that a lot of our theology, almost all of our theology, comes from a thousand years of celibate and and vowed religious reflection they've had the luxury for a thousand years of reflecting theologically on their life and their practices and their spirituality if the third millennium is going to be the millennium of the laity is there any thought being given either at the synod or in theological schools to seeing the lay experience as a locus theologicus. We're 99% of the church. I think God is busy there. So can we actually develop a rigorous theology, as rigorous as anything we've developed to de around all the different manifestations of religious life and priesthood? I would just love to see somebody take that on. Any comments about that? 
Thank you, uh, Kathy. I'll just take one more question, uh, Chris, and a um, uh, wonderful question. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Um, I'd like to first uh, thank Father for sharing the uh, the picture. Um, it, it was a it was a very apt picture, right? It shows uh, not only the um, I guess kind of removal of this top down structure, but this more circular familial structure that the uh, you know the church that the synod is really putting forth now. Um, so that was a a great photo. Um, so. I'd like to address a few things and then ask my question, if I may. So um, I'm a little younger. Uh, the thing that I've experienced and that I've observed is I've, I've moved like four different times in the same city. And uh, tons of my friends, we, we are often to some degree nomadic. Um, also, uh, the parish priest. So I've stayed at a parish for over six years now. And, you know, we've had uh, two different parish priests. And um, in the midst of all this change and these shifting sands of the lay of the land, there's a strong uh, digital presence for um, catechesis. And I'm going to just try to, like, make a turn of phrase here, obtuse catechesis, if you will, online. Though it's... Uh, that strange or bizarre, it's much more consistent, right? I, I know it'll be there for me. So I, I, the question that I'm coming to with giving you that, uh, that lay of the land is, how are we going to, on the parish level, ensure, um, how, how should I say this, uh, secure synodality or, or um, I guess I'll stick with that secure synodality for the long term so that the synodality practice at the parish level doesn't become some soup du jour when uh, this spearheading parishioner leaves or this bishop is now shuffled around or these priests are shuffled around. Thank you. Um, yeah, so at the parish level um, as well, um, how do we engage parishioners that's that's one of the other questions and then uh, theology of the laity so if anyone wants to go ahead on those questions great mm -hmm. questions thank you one thing the document uh, does talk about and is right is to, to the first and third question we're looking at how do we engage parishioners it's very conscious that our sense of place today is very different than our sense of place when Vatican II happened, for example. The, the, the mobility now of people is quite significant, has great significance for the Eastern churches, for example, who are probably even very deeply affected by that. And the document speaks nicely to that, uh, that we don't Latinize people from the Eastern churches because they moved into Latin territory, if you will. But the, that whole point that, that that sense of place, particularly in a digital age, no longer means the ge geographic locus that it meant in the past. And we haven't come to terms with that as a society, let alone as a church. So your questions are very important questions, I feel, in terms of how do we have the conversations that even talk about that? that how do we engage, and that's well, how, inclusion is really hard because we like to hang with our own kind of people, but how do we bring in to a conversation, the, the, how do we have those conversations with, with young people, the intergenerational point that I made? I think it's not an accident that the, very, the last whole section of the document talks about formation together and brings out that point that what what formation looks like in Montreal is going to be very different from what even in Canada from what formation looks like in St. John's or in Nain in Labrador so how do we get leadership then that understands that at a time when many of our parishes don't even have parish priests anymore uh, even if they were engaged in this and how do we build leadership among all of us in, in different ways, that is an onerous task. And that's why 
the document says to the conferences of bishops that we have to make sure that the bishops take this seriously and put personnel and resources in place to make it happen. I read that, and maybe it's my administrative mind, that every single diocese should have some kind of a structure around synodality focused intentionally in this area, addressing those very diverse questions depending on where that diocese is. There are some dioceses in Canada over such huge geogra geographic territory with very small numbers, very different from downtown Montreal or downtown Toronto. So how so we need to recognize that and we require leadership to do that. The digital yeah. issue is quite complicated, is made more complicated now by artificial intelligence. And again, I know nothing about this, but I know enough to know that if we're not in that game, we're not going to be where people are present. So it's quite significant. Thank you. Um, just before we continue on with the next questions, um, uh, we had another question that was sent in about um, the connection between um, truth and reconciliation and synodality. Um, and I'm just aware that it is eight o'clock. So just a uh, very brief announcements and then we'll return to the questions for those of you who can stay um, and want to stay. Um, so the, we have taken a recording. So if you got in late because of technicalities or whatever, um, that will be sent to you. Um, and and we will send a follow-up question and, and a question for moving on from here. Also, what's happening in your own parishes? Uh, so we can tackle that after uh, after we're finished with this. And um, and if you want to respond to the follow-up email, that would be great. We'd love to know. Um, so yeah, truth and reconciliation, um, theology of the laity, uh, ways to engage parishioners, and um, yeah, the, the in, about the endurance of, of this uh, movement for synodality. Well, maybe, I don't know, I, I probably would rather defer to Bob to see whether he has something to say about the theology of the laity as the lay person on the panel. Um, but I think the what's going to be essential is that lay people be engaged theologically and we start taking that theology seriously. It was nice to see an increased number both in the facilitators group and in the group of experts, theological experts, who were lay people. I would say at least close to half of the lay of the theologians who were working as uh, in, in experts and on panels were lay people this year. And they made great contributions. People like Kathy Clifford, like Anna Rowlands, like uh, Miriam Wylands, there were just um, so many who made amazing contributions. So they, and I think you're right, the, the a theology of the laity is something that we need to really address. And we need to stop defining people by what they're not. You know, even like the lay delegates were, you know, and even as well as the priests delegates were like, you know, delegates not equipped with the Episcopal munus. It was, it's never nice to be defined by what you're not. <laughs> It's much better to be defined by what you are. I just wanted to say a word about the question that Chris raised. Um, it is one of the challenges is that, you know, how, 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 you know, all it takes is a change in pastoral leadership, whether a bishop in a diocese or a parish priest in a parish to often seemingly block or change the direction. And I think the goal of a synodal church would be becoming less dependent on the personal preferences and the uh, particular theological angle of who happens to be an authority when there's a recognition that authority is not only belong to one person, but is something that is shared. And I think that means that there's, there, there's, there's, I think, a responsibility placed on us who are, who are concerned about these things to continue to carry that torch. Um, it, something that, that happened at, at, at the very last day of the synod after the the entire uh final document was voted paragraph at a time 155 paragraphs and they all passed and the pope when the pope announced that he was sort of like going to publish the document right away not write an apostolic exhortation there was a big round of applause because it was really it was an expression of confidence in the process and in the people who had gathered but then he said this and perhaps this is a challenge for all of us he says the final document is a gift to all the faithful people of god but not everyone is going to set out to read it <laughs> it will largely fall to you together with many others to make what it contains accessible in the local churches. 
Without the witness of lived experience, the text will lose much of its value. What we have experienced is a gift that we cannot keep to ourselves. The impetus that comes from this experience of which the document is a reflection gives us the courage to witness that it is possible to walk together in diversity. So it seems to me that what we have experienced is not just the we, the, the roughly 400 people to 500 people who participated directly in the synodal assemblies, all of us who've been involved at the parish level, at the national level, who are concerned about these things, we're, we are part of the solution. Uh, and I, I, and we need to encourage each other, reinforce each other, continue to be educated and formed and not have our voice taken away from us. So that's, uh, seems to me that that, I think that's the challenge and, uh, and to continue to, 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 to bear witness, uh, even sometimes as somebody said, I think it was Bob used the words lethargy and sometimes hostility. So how do we persevere that, that that's going to be the, the, the key. Uh, on the truth and reconciliation point, I, as you know, not everybody around the world talks about Indigenous people or sees Indigenous people in the same way we do in Canada. And that points to what I believe is a significant reference yet again to the different contexts. Um, for I, us in Canada, where this is a very important issue, I think synodality is incredibly important. And I think, Raymond, you experienced uh, Archbishop Boland's leadership in that area in Saskatchewan. But a synodal church would have to be an inclusive, indigenous, inclusive church. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in Canada a synodal church. It couldn't be. So that's why the context does matter. The country in which you live does matter. The part of the country in which you live does matter. Again, not as Bob said, nothing about us without us uh, has to be the mantra there. And many Indigenous people in Canada were out of the Catholic culture uh, in, in terms of, of uh, uh, the colonization of them. So we really do need to be very attentive to that in our way of being a synodal church in Canada. In terms of the theology of the laity, uh, I, I think this is a is a huge issue. It's about the sense of the faithful. And the, the document begins to bring us back to that, even though it keeps using Latin phrases to explain it as if any of us spoke Latin anymore. But <clears throat> it, it is... It is a very, it's a, a synodal church has to be a church that represents the people. And the document itself fails in that. When you read our document, uh, the final document uses still an us and them. They talk about women as if we are not the we of the church. They talk about elderly people as if we're not the we of the church. They talk about disabled persons, like it's us and them. So it fails even in the vision is putting forward it fails to materialize it in its own writing of the document. So it's this is not easy. This is not easy to do. Uh, and you have to be very thin-skinned to be sensitive enough to accepting those kinds of realities that, you know, the assumptions are the things we don't know we have. And the document drives me insane by talking about women as if we're a crowd of, out there, as opposed to us. Most of us in this church are women. We're the crowd in here and you're the crowd out there, cardinals and priests and bishops. But that's not how the document reads. So the church falls back into that, exactly what Kathy was alluding to. And it sticks in religious women every now and then to legitimize doing that, which also drives me stark raving mad. But uh, <clears throat> but I think we have to be sensitive. We're, we're a long way for being well on this journey yet. And I'm fearful that our Canadian bishops are not getting that message. I really am. Thank you. Um, I just, uh, I, Donna, do you want to ask your question? Uh, I just have a comment. Um, it was a long time ago, like I, I'd say close to 30 years ago, I was liturgy director in the Diocese of Antigonish in Nova Scotia. And I went around various parishes doing workshops for the various liturgical ministries. And I also met with, 
you know, parishioners for whatever issues that they wanted to discuss. And I, this one still stands out for me and I still hear it echoing in my mind. A gentleman spoke up once they found out that I was open to listen to hear what they had to say about women's ordination. This gentleman said, sister, he said, I have a 14 year old daughter. She's a beautiful girl. She comes to church with me every week. And he said, one day after mass, she came home and said, daddy, I'm so sick of this. And he was kind of shaken in his boots thinking she was going to stop going to, to church or whatever. Anyway, she said, father says every week, pray for vocations to the priesthood, pray for vocations to the priesthood. But if I said, I thought I had a vocation to the priesthood, the church doesn't want me. So I think this is the kind of things that, you know, then our young people are hearing this. So I, you know, I don't know how we can open that discussion more freely, but I mean, I've, that echoes that her, his comment still echoes in my brain. The church doesn't want me. So anyway, that's just my little two cents worth. Thank you. What, um, the, what the document says, but doesn't believe what comes from the spirit cannot be stopped. That should be our mantra. What comes from the spirit cannot be stopped. I have a question that came from the organizing committee. Um, and and just a, a comment that actually uh, Lucy, Lucy mentioned uh, earlier, it came from an article about that, uh, about half of the bishops uh, worldwide are in the, at the Vatican. Um, so, you know, in, in curia positions and they don't have a people. They don't have a diocese, they don't have, um, so, and then the other part of it is if um, the bishops in our countries or the bishops in our diocese, um, if the leadership is not behind this, you know, if they're not pushing this syn synodality or providing leadership opportunities, how do we move forward um, in this? And, and for sure, um, Bob gave us a, a great, um, but we also need, uh, you know, resources, we need leadership uh, preparation and things like that. So how, what are the ways forward that you see? One of the things that the document does nicely is, as I mentioned in my presentation, is expands local church beyond just parishes and dioceses. It includes academic institutions, schools, um, universities, colleges. It includes places of ministry. It includes lay movements. And I would consider most of the reform movements in our church as our lay movements. It includes institutes of religious life. So in addition to the hierarchical structure in the church, there's a whole other, piece, or, or many other pieces of the church structure, which where more people actually are very much engaged that I think are very much part of the answer to that question, Tara, that people in ministry, that's why formation has to be for all, all the groups, not just for parishes. And because parishes are going to give us 10% of the members of the church in Canada. At best, even if you did it perfectly, we're reaching 10% of the people in the church. So this is not a hypothetical question. This is a very real question because that's how many of us go to church anymore, as you know. So it's these other places. And that's why I like the document naming those elements of the local church beyond the parish and the diocese. But at the end of the day, we really do need to get the bishops and priests very much on fire with this. I think I, it is really going to work as well. Thank you. I'd just like to uh, make two comments. Um, first of all, uh, I was scribbling something down about we, they, and then 10 seconds later, Elizabeth was, was saying that. Um, one contribution that anybody can make is to quickly look at whatever document comes up, read it fast, and get back to the author if you find we, they language in it. And if if it if that document cannot be written in except by doing we 
be they, then ask the question whether the process that led up to the writing of that draft or that document, whether the process itself was flawed by not uh, having the wide participation. Because if, if um, well, you know what? I don't want to. I don't want to say anything inflammatory about anything in Canada now. So how about if I say this? If there's a document about monogamous and polygamous uh, marriages, and it's written about we uh, have to tell those people in polygamous uh, relationships, blah 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 blah. Right? Mm -hmm. What that means is that there weren't any polygamous people in the group writing the document right so so uh, check whether there's that language and challenge it and if it's just sloppy writing great improve the writing but if it's if it reflects that that kind of exclusionary um, basis then then you, you raise that question so and that kind of lets me segue into the other point I think we have to take the concept of unconscious bias really seriously We've we've seen too much going on in uh, with respect to treatment of women, with respect to people of other races than the than the uh, than the secure majority, um, and so on and so on and so on. To not take that seriously, and and if the people who are used to having more of a say and stuff um, keep saying the same things over and over again, in spite of the signs of the times. Then we have to accuse them of look you're not paying attention to the signs of the times and therefore there's only two possible explanations either unconscious bias or conscious bias which hat you want to what which you one would you prefer to wear mm -hmm. thank you and we had a we had a comment um from father elias or elias um creating synodal committees in each diocese will be a key sort of factor moving forward, which I think is uh, great. Yeah, I was, I was going to add that I, I'm, I'm anxious to see whether there's going to be any kind of official ecclesial response in Canada coming out of the Bishops' Conference. Uh, I've been home for a few weeks now and I haven't heard anything yet, but it's my intention if I don't hear anything in the next week or so to actually write to the conference and say, you know, we were all there together or, you know, the uh we got a challenge there's actually a pretty direct uh request in the final document to invest time energy and resources into implementing synodality so if that's going to be a bit a responsibility incumbent on well on the church as a whole but on the bishops in particular then there's going to need to be some kind of an action plan to follow that up um i appreciated also what elizabeth said about local church it's, it's true i mean well, I would never suggest that people give up on their local parishes. I think local parishes, when they work well, and we certainly had the example of St. Basil's that uh, Bob shared with us this evening as a parish that is doing a lot and responding and trying to be that kind of a community. But there are other forms of belonging and that we need to encourage as well. Um, and I think there's a lot more intentional forms of community people gathered around a common interest, a common passion, uh, a common spirituality, a common vision. And I think that those need to be developed as well. Um, uh, in his closing remarks, Pope Francis quoted Madeleine del Berel, who was a sort of a mystic of the inner city and uh, a woman who was writing in France in the early part of the 20th century. And he quoted her at the very end saying that there are many places in which the spirit breathes but, on, but, and, but only one spirit who breathes in all places. And perhaps that we remember that, that the, that, you know, the parish is wonderful, but it's not the only place where the spirit breathes. There are many places where the spirit breathes, and we need to be attentive to the voices of the spirit wherever they come from. Thanks. I think this idea of a church that goes out of itself um, to find those places as well, and thinking about truth and reconciliation, um, that, yeah, that we, um, we know love a girl live in a world that revolves around, that has the social around the parish. And so I think, uh, yeah, you, you know, going out and, and seeking and, and participating where the spirit is, um, is moving and the outside of the parish as well. Um, Sister Mary T.
I don't have a question, but just a comment and to say that I'm very grateful. I'm very happy to hear uh, this wonderful session this evening, especially from uh, Sister Elizabeth, Father Raymond and Robert. It's been um, a very inspiring and insight insightful. And I'm just thinking it really takes us back to the words of Jesus at the Last Supper that all may be one. And we hear so much, I hear, like walking together and the importance of walking together. And I've heard that over and over and over again, but I've never really heard the fullness of it, walking together as equals. That part has been left out. And I wonder why, walking together as equals. And I've been hearing a thirst and a desire for that tonight. And also, I'm just wondering, you know, like about uh, the whole story of the new story of creation and the new universe story that we have that is so full and uh, for today's world and for what we're talking about. And we're talking a lot about theology, but the science and the astronauts who have gone into space and saw, looked back at Earth and saw it with no borders no decisions, no divisions, and no separations. And they said that that was a glimpse of divinity. So we have in our day now, glimpse divinity. Yeah. And we're all trying to catch up with that. And also, like when, when Father Raymond spoke about the um, the 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 shepherd and the sheep and you know there's a there's a a bit of a, a culture in our parishes uh, about the shepherd and the sheep when we hear you know it's really a culture of the sheep really there's some sheep that are living in a culture of silence because they can't speak to authority and they don't have the voice and they're afraid of being misinterpreted or we all are, I suppose, in a sense. So there's that uh, angle to it. And some young people now uh, have asked me to go into a group uh, to study the pedagogy of the oppressed by, by um, Paolo uh, Brera. And, uh, you know, he talks about the, the, uh, class system and he says to think that we're not living in a class system today you know in his time and even today we're fooling ourselves so you know it's it's a wonderful time of reawakening in the church and if we could only uh, continue with that it would be wonderful but as sister elizabeth said we have fears with regard to our parishes and our priests and our bishops and so on so, but the, the grassroots are yearning for it. So thank you so very much. Yeah. Francis, did you? Um, I just want, was wondering, uh, first of all, thank you to all of the presenters. Um, back in 1992 in Calgary, they had a diocesan synod, uh, or Saskatoon, I think was first. In 92 and in 90, 93, 94, and 95, Saskatoon, Calgary, and Edmonton all had diocesan synods. And I'm surprised. I mean, I think today, if you were doing a diocesan synod, there would have to be a digital aspect of it, just because, you know, most, as Sister Elizabeth mentioned, 10% are in the pews and kind of paying for the upkeep of the church as well. So that's a challenge today. But I wondered if there was any discussion about the importance of diocesan synods and uh, doing them in a digital manner. Just a question. And thank you again for all your presentations. Uh, I can jump in because uh, I, I had many conversations with Kathy Clifford about this question. Kathy was one of the big people at the Synod who was reminding people of the importance of the diocesan synod as not an extraordinary, but as an ordinary part of church governance. 
and um and she, and then and she said and and yet since the second vatican council less than one third of the dioceses in the world mm -hmm. have had any kind of a diocesan synod in that in that 55 60 year period so um and that's and there is a number i don't remember the paragraph number off the top of my head but there's definitely a paragraph that re strongly recommends the uh, the reinstitution of the diocesan synod as a, as as an ordinary form of government it's not something that not 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 something that you do extraordinarily every 50 years but as an an ordinary part of church governance and also as an important way of measuring uh transparency and accountability thank you So we're we're nearing 8.30, we're nearing two hours. We still have two thirds of participants on uh, almost a half an hour after the official close. So I think that's really a testament to um, our panelists. Uh, so I really just wanna thank uh, Sister Elizabeth, Bob and uh, Father Raymond and, and the organizing committee for, uh, for all the work you put in. Um, we will be sending out a follow-up. I do just wanna um, just share my screen very briefly for those of you who are still here. Um, Tara, in that follow-up, can you send copies of our slides if people want them? Yes, absolutely. Um, I need to give you my most recent. I made a couple of minor changes in mine, so I will send you mine. But a number of people sent me messages to ask, would they be available? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's an upcoming event that... Uh, that is related to synodality and listening. Um, that uh, spearheaded uh, by the um, uh, um, Jesuit Forum for Social Faith and Justice, but supported um, by a number of different um, organizations, including the Saint Obla. Um, so we are, yeah, discerning our votes in politically charged times as we head towards uh, federal elections and some of you um, also prov provincial elections as well. So uh, we'll send that information about how to sign up. It's on December 10th, it's online. Uh, from five to seven Eastern standards. So uh, you'll receive an invite for that as well in the follow-up email.